Hello, art nerds. I have another sketch to finish watercolor tutorial for you guys today. Today, we're going to be sketching, inking, and painting a cluster of crystals surrounded by glowing mushrooms. Try saying that five times fast. I'm painting with what I have, and I encourage you to paint with what you have, but you are going to want a darker colored or a black watercolor for today, preferably something with a little bit of interesting granulation. So, are you guys ready to paint along with me? If you don't feel like doing the sketching and inking part, I shared the line art over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash natosoup for my wonderful patrons to enjoy. They can now explore a whole myriad of printable line arts and coloring sheets in the new coloring sheet collection. I am super duper excited about that. So I hope you guys will head on over and check it out. But the materials we are using today are fairly minimal. I have this sketched in my Canson XL watercolor sketchbook. I have a cheapo ceramic plate from Dollar Tree. I have my massive Daily Driver watercolor palette, although I promise you won't need a palette this large. And I have a few watercolor brushes, some rounds here to the side, as well as a paper towel and a cup of clean water. You're also going to want a colored lead pencil. I'm using red as well as a Sakura Pigma FB or other waterproof pin. So I am super excited to share this with you guys today. I hope you guys are just as excited to draw ink and paint along with me today. So grab your paints, grab your brushes, and let's get creating. Over to my left, you guys will see that I have a very loose thumbnail sketch of the illustration I have in mind. So I am trying to transpose that very basic sketch into my Canson XL watercolor sketchbook. I am using Pentel Red Lead for this in a Muji mechanical pencil, but really you can use whatever you're comfortable with. You can even use graphite if you so wish. The plus side to the colored lead is that it basically disappears once I paint over it. I am using red because my camera picks it up a little bit better than some of the other colors that I've used. So once I have the basic idea down, I can make some room on my desk and remove my sketchbook. And I can also start tightening up my illustration and adding in more details. When I'm working with the red lead, I'm working really, really light because it doesn't erase as well as one might hope. And I wanna make sure that I don't have any extra lines that I don't want or need. So we're gonna sketch it really lightly first, which admittedly makes it harder to see. And then we're going to go in and tighten in the details once we have our composition sketched out. And most of these sketch to finished watercolor illustrations are a central composition. So everything is pretty center of the paper. That makes it a little bit easier for you guys to follow along if you so wish, but feel free to mix things up, spice things up as you go along if you want. I am also working from reference. So I think I Googled like crystal points, quartz crystals, things like that. And I also Googled glowing mushrooms. So I am referencing from two different sources here just to kind of get the gist. And the whole point of referencing is to take what you like about the image, take the information you need, like how crystal formations form or the facets in the crystals themselves and to kind of make it your own. So I encourage you to combine multiple different sources of reference to change things, to move crystal points around for the composition that you want. Whatever helps you make the illustration you want to make, feel free to do that. But reference is a super helpful tool that every artist should avail themselves of. Don't feel weird or guilty about utilizing reference to understand how things actually look and to figure out how to draw them. So most of these start to finish illustrations have a little bit of moss down at the bottom. So I just kind of loosely sketched in some moss down there. And once I have my sketch complete and I'm fairly happy with it, it is time to ink it. So since we 
are going to be watercoloring on top of this. And since I am going to scan this and share the line art on Patreon, I want to make sure that I have the line art down first so I can actually share it. I am inking it with a Sakura Pigma FB. This is one of my favorite brush pens. I use these all the time. They are a waterproof and alcohol marker safe brush pen. The trick with these is I am going to ink my illustration, taking my time, vibing out to some nice relaxing music. I tend to pull my brush strokes as I pull in my breath. So it really needs to be kind of a relaxing activity for you where you're going to have minimal distractions. Now, if you're like me and you have increasing hand pain from arthritis or uh, RA, you might want to schedule in some breaks to give your hand a chance to rest so it doesn't cramp up and you don't get fatigued fatigued and that way you can give your inks the best that you can give them. So if you need to break this up, feel free to break it up into stages. You guys will notice that I like to start with the images, the objects, whatever it might be, closest to the viewer and then work my way back. And one of the beautiful things about using a brush pen like this is it actually has a variable line weight built in. So if you apply a very light pressure, you're going to get a very fine brush stroke. If you apply a heavier brush, uh, if you are heavier in how you apply your line weight, you're going to get a heavier brush stroke. This is so great. It makes inking so much faster for me than using technical pens because I can do everything from delicate little eyelashes to really heavy shadow lines. One little tip if you're inking along, and it really depends on what you're inking. So our mushrooms are going to be glowing and that's why I didn't do a heavier line art on the mushrooms. But typically I will give objects in the foreground, objects closer to the viewer, heavier line weight, and lighten up my line weight as we go backwards away from the viewer into the distance as things become a little bit fuzzier or maybe a little bit more difficult to see. And that gives us this illusion of depth and perspective. Of course, if things are light in color, if things are lightweight like a feather, if things are very delicate like eyelashes or hair, you may want to mix things up and you may want to save those lighter line weights for those objects. But the beautiful thing about inking is you can approach it a variety of different ways and still convey the same message. It's really up to you. So if you are interested in improving your inking or you want to learn how to ink, I highly, 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 highly recommend you read comics. And I also recommend you read manga, which are comics, but some people don't think about manga when they think about comics and vice versa. The way to get better at making art, especially illustrative art, is to consume more of that kind of art. So when it comes to inking, I really think comics are just king. Comics and manga are king at showing you how to do just that. And there are so many wonderful inking references and resources in regards to comics and in regards to manga that will really help you hone your craft and to learn new skills. So I highly recommend you give comics a try if you're not a comics fan yet. So you guys can see I've kind of just worked my way around the illustration. Now I am adding in some little additional details, maybe some extra crystal points, and I am working on inking the moss down at the bottom. I am not going to ink the circle around our crystal points. And this has been consistent with my sketch to finish tutorials because we use that to kind of create a vignette in watercolor, just super simple. Um, and that kind of lightens up the background and it doesn't make it feel so heavy. So once I have inked it, I allowed it to dry for 24 hours. I scanned it and now it's time to paint and I am painting glowing mushrooms. So I have this greenish yellow that I'm applying first and I'm expanding it beyond the border of the mushrooms line art. And this is gonna give us kind of the illusion of glowing. You can use a cool yellow for this or if you want to do a different color for your glowing mushrooms, feel free to do so. Like let's say you wanna do teal glowing mushrooms, right? You might wanna start with your yellow and then work your way into your blues. So basically we are going to be using an analogous color palette for our mushrooms, so not quite monochromatic. While that's still wet, I'm gonna grab a little bit more of, I probably grabbed another yellow green that I happen to have in my palette, maybe a little bit darker, but really you could just work more saturated at this point. And I'm adding it towards the bottom of my little mushroom caps 
while the paint is still wet. I'm gonna move towards a bluer green now. If you are working with just yellow, you could start adding in a little bit of blue. And I am going to, again, add it in wet into wet, kind of towards the bottom and then kind of towards the top. And I'm really just trying to think about how to create this glow illusion. And this is also where, even though I have a very cartoony art style, this is clearly not realistic. I'm working from reference to kind of get an idea of how this glow should look and how I can most effectively paint my glow. You guys see me adding in a little bit more blue and I'm gonna keep working it in while it's still wet. If it's not totally wet, that's fine. But with these cellulose papers, they can dry a little funny. So basically, if it is very humid outside, it's gonna take forever for your paper to dry. And if it's very dry outside, it's gonna dry in an instant because cellulose papers keep the water on the surface. They don't really absorb the water. This is not always a great thing, but if you know how to control it and you know how to work with it, you can still get the techniques you want and it makes for a faster watercolor illustration, which is kind of the point of these sketch to finish illustrations. Now I've mixed up a light purple and I am referencing amethyst points for this. So I wanna really cap capture the kind of depth of purples that we can get, that we see with beautiful amethyst points. Wow, I don't know why I'm having such a hard time saying that word. So again, I am kind of over painting. I am extending it beyond the border of our amethyst. Our mushrooms have had a chance to dry, so they're not really bleeding into the amethyst. Wouldn't really be a big deal if they did. I'm going in with some more mauve or a reddish violet, and I'm working it in wet into wet at the tops, but I'm still kind of referencing my reference photo photos so I know kind of what I'm going for and what I'm looking for. I'm not painting any one particular set of crystal points. I'm kind of taking elements that I like from multiple crystal points. And most of the painting in this illustration was done with one, maybe two rounds, maybe a quill. I'm working with silver black velvet. I happen to like mixed fiber brushes. You should work with what you're comfortable with using. I'm grabbing a darker purple now. I believe this is, oh shoot. It is a Daniel Smith color that granulates out into some darker colors. I do not believe it is lunar violet. It doesn't super matter. A Tyrian purple, um, a still warm purple, but a darker, I guess that would be violet. Purples and violets were always kind of mistaught when I was growing up because I think purples are bluer and violets are redder, but I might have that mixed up. Let me know down in the comments. Anyway, I'm trying to stay warm, but getting darker. Now I am grabbing a little bit of our dioxine purple. So this is a cool, very saturated, very dark purple. And I'm gonna use that for kind of my darkest areas on the crystal. And we're trying to work quickly because we're working wet into wet. We want these colors to kind of diffuse and blend out and give us these really soft transitions. Also wanna let you guys know that this whole video has been sped up 4X. I painted this illustration over the course of like four, maybe five hours, one evening, very leisurely. That includes, you know, the dry times. That includes me taking breaks to do other things. Um, so if you are working in a really dry environment, it might go quicker. If you're working in a very wet environment, turn on your AC and turn on a fan, get some air movement going on. So once our crystal points have had a chance to start to dry, I'm going in with a second layer and really kind of building up and developing the color. Now, you with your illustration can do whatever color crystals you want. You could do some beautiful watermelon tourmaline and get those pinks and those greens going on. You could go with a lighter color for your amethyst. You could do citrine. You could use rose, do rose quartz. You could do a fantasy color. It really, whatever makes your heart sing, go for it. I encourage you to do it. I happen to really like amethyst, so I wanted to go with that. And I found some really beautiful reference images that really have this beautiful color shift of the really dark grapey purple to like the softer, lighter, almost red lavenders. So that's really what I wanted to kind of convey here. And it also kind of contrasts with the greens in our glowing mushrooms. So I really wanted to go with that as well. But you can do whatever color combinations you like and you find inspiring. So I am at this point adding our second layer of color working a little bit more saturated. And I am also trying to keep in mind the faces 
or the facets of the crystals because that's what really makes crystals look crystalline is to have these really distinct faces on the crystals and the way you do that is through contrast and by making sure you don't paint everything the same way every single time. So I'm trying to reserve some of the faces of the crystals and not add in secondary layers. I also don't want the crystal cluster to just turn into a mush. And if you over render it, that could be a possibility. If you color it all the same way, that could be a possibility. So basically, if you keep it really, really light, it's gonna be more distinct and easier to read as a cluster of crystals or you can really focus on building up individual colors and then leaving some of your crystals a little bit less rendered and making sure that you reserve some of the faces of the crystals so that they are not quite as rendered and you have that contrast and it's easier to read. We're also going to be using white gouache a little bit later on to add some highlights in and to define some areas. So we're also gonna kind of pull things back a little bit more later on. I'm working in a watercolor sketchbook. You are free to work on whatever watercolor paper you like. I'm actually trying to fill up this little sketchbook. So I have kind of a goal in mind. There's something really satisfying about having a sketchbook like this, just full of these little illustrations. It makes the brain go burr. So that's one of the goals I'm kind of working on. And I have some failed illustrations in here and I have some successful illustrations in here. It doesn't all have to be perfect. The goal is just to complete it and to get the ideas that are in your mind actually out on the paper. You guys might have noticed these metal bars that I have across my paper. These are Chinese watercolor weights. I love these things. These things are so helpful. I use them, you see them in a lot of my videos. I use them all the time. They are meant to hold down uh, rice paper while it's being painted on because you wouldn't stretch rice paper the way you might stretch a cotton rag watercolor paper. Uh, but what I like about these is even with cotton rag paper, they can kind of help hold down the edges of a sketchbook. Or if I've removed a watercolor from its blue tape and it's very humid outside, it can kind of help hold the watercolor paper down while it finishes drying. Even if I thought it was fully dry and let it dry several hours, sometimes it'll reabsorb atmospheric moisture. So these things are really, these are really great. And I got mine on Amazon, but there's a variety of places where you can find them if you're looking for them. I specifically wanted longer bars because I find it does a better job of actually holding down my paper. You could use clips if you want to use clips. What I love about these is they are very easy to reposition and to kind of just move them around. And since I have some manual dexterity issues in my hand, clips can sometimes give me trouble and I'd be less likely to move them around. So these are a little bit easier for me. So at this point, um, it's going to kind of vary. If you're working from the line art, you guys can, if you want to, just kind of copy what I'm doing. If you're working from your own inspiration and you were just using today's tutorial as kind of like a, a catalyst to get you to draw some crystals and some mushrooms, like awesome on you. Good on you. I'm so proud of you. But at this point, it's mostly like looking at the reference, making some decisions, working layer over layer and wet into wet and building up the colors that I want. And it can be really hard to articulate this in a step after step sort of fashion because it really depends on what you're painting and what you want from it and your mood and what you're looking for. So this was just how I was feeling this evening when I was painting it. I'm actually still really happy with how it turned out. Those crystals look so good but there might be a day when I wanna go all pastel with my crystals and leave them really light and really shiny and I would have a totally different approach. In fact, if you guys wanna see me do like watermelon tourmaline as a sketch to finish watercolor tutorial, let me know down in the comments below. I'm always looking for your feedback and encouragement. If you enjoy these kind of sketch to finish tutorials, let me know that as well. Now that I'm pretty happy with the crystals, I'm gonna add another layer of greenish yellow to the mushrooms to really kind of reinforce that 
day glow green color. And then while that's drying, I am using a granulating green. This is Daniel Smith's undersea green, but you can use whatever color you like for the moss. You don't have to be particular. You can mix something that'll granulate out for you as well. I just happen to like this because it's pre-mixed. It's super convenient. And I happen to love how this color looks. It's like the color of Louisiana. So I did a light wash at first to kind of encourage granulation. And then I am going to go in with a more saturated mix on my brush while it's still wet and just kind of dab it in in the shadows to kind of create more depth to our moss without having to do a whole lot of work. While our moss is drying, I'm going to go into Payne's Gray and I am going to start painting the background. So I'm starting with a much lighter color than I want to end up with because this is one of the ways we are going to achieve that glow effect. You could use a blue for this, you can use a purple for this, you can just water down your black. You have some options. I just happen to really like the color Payne's Gray. So that's what I'm going with for this. But you can do what you want and what suits the colors from your illustration. A really dark red might look really cool. Um, Payne's Gray is just what I happen to grab. While our Payne's Gray is drying, I am grabbing some more of our bluish green and I'm just going to add it kind of to the base of the mushrooms, just kind of refining them and trying to really push the glow effect while referencing actual cave mushrooms over on my computer screen. So a lot of the weird pastel -y colors in my palette are Holbein and Turner watercolors, if you guys are curious about that. So I switched palettes over to my Daniel Smith Super Granulating Colors. I actually have a big old Super Granulation review that I did of those if you guys are curious about what's in my palette here. I can't tell you off the top of my head. I am so sorry, but I think I'm just adding in some more of our undersea green down at the bottom, encouraging it to granulate. Maybe some cascade green. That's another really beautiful granulating green from Daniel Smith. And I believe I grabbed this palette for either lunar purple or lunar black. I am grabbing some more Payne's Gray. I just have my giant palette up at the top. And as you guys can, no, I lied to you guys, but not intentionally. I grabbed some black and mixed it with the Payne's Gray. This is probably lamp black. You guys can see I'm actually leaving a bit of a border around our crystals. And then I'm going in with some clean water and I'm kind of blending that out wet into wet. If you really want to push it, you can add a lot of water here and create blooms into your black, which would be a really beautiful and interesting effect that I kind of wish I thought to do, but I didn't think to do it. While it's still wet, I am going in with a more saturated black around our crystals and just kind of adding it up to that wet into wet water edge so that it kind of blends in with that and we get kind of a diffused glow effect with our crystals. I like how I pulled out my super granulating colors for the lunar black and then I don't even think I used the lunar black for this. I think I realized I didn't need it. So once our illustration has dried, if you want to add some white highlights or if you want to change and adjust things, you can definitely use gouache over this. I'm using white gouache here to add some white highlights to some of the faces of the crystals and to make them pop out against the black background. You can use other colors of gouache as well if you want to add some opaque highlights to your illustration. You can also use watercolor pencils if you so wish. You can use acrylic markers, whatever you have that you like that will add the effects that you want for this, go for it. This is in our sketchbooks, unless you chose not to put it in your sketchbook, it's totally up to you. So feel free to get real mixed media with it and experiment with it. Those of you who have hung out with me for a while know that I am absolutely not a watercolor purist by any stretch of the imagination. As a watercolor comic artist, I, <laughs> I don't think I can claim that. So I am all about getting mixed media and doing what you need to do to make the illustration look the way you want to make it look. So that's why we're using our white gouache in a fine synthetic round just to add some pops of white, some rim lighting, and some highlighting to make our crystals and our mushrooms really pop.
I switched to a larger round to add some bigger white details and then I dipped it in my gouache, added a little bit of water and now I'm doing the hammer on the brush splatter technique. And this works best if there's enough water in the brush and the brush is floppy enough. I've also grabbed a very pastel light green to do the same with the mushrooms. I'm also grabbing a little bit of a cool yellow to do as well. And I'm probably going to grab a little bit of that pastel purple or not, who knows? But you can use gouache to kind of add these little like speckles and to really just kind of make it appear a little bit more glowy and a little bit more magical. Also, if you want to, this could be a really fun one to pull your metallic and iridescent and color shift watercolors out and use those to add highlights or to add little accents of color. Some gold specks would be super pretty on this. And of course, it's never too late to go back in and adjust the contrast just a little bit to shift things, to change things, to clean things up. We are not past that point. In, in fact, with white gouache, if you let it dry, you can actually add a little bit of color on top of it and that'll create a little uh, highlight. You can also mix your color with your gouache to create your highlight. So you have options. But here we have it, another finished sketch to finish watercolor tutorial. I took you from the sketch phase to the inking phase to the watercolor phase. If you just want to color along with me, I shared a printable coloring line art over on my Patreon. I also share printing instructions for several different modes of coloring. So if you're not sure what kind of color you want to use, whether it's color pencils, marker, or watercolor for this. I have instructions on how to print it for all of those. I wanna thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I really love doing these sketch to finish tutorials. They are a great way to fill up a sketchbook and to share my love of the whole art process with you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you like my art, it would really mean a lot to me if you check me out over on Instagram. I'll put the link here and I'll also have it down in the description. And I also have a watercolor webcomic which you can read for free at 7inchcara.com. If you're a fan of the dead tree format, it is also available in print through my shop as well as on Amazon. So even my international friends can read 7 Inch Kara as a print book if they so desire. I will have those links for you guys down in the description below. I want to thank you guys so much for spending a half hour with me. I hope this was inspiring for you guys. I hope I encouraged you to pick up a pencil, pick up a pen, pick up your paints, and make something today because it is my goal to help you guys make art a habit. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. I hope you guys found this helpful, useful, and informative, and I hope to see you guys again soon. If you're new here, why don't you click the subscribe button and hit the bell notification and let YouTube know that you'd like to see more reviews, tutorials, and artist chats from me. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I hope to see you guys again soon. Bye guys!